Coming up on Digital Music Trends 170, recorded on the 12th of February 2014, a roundup of 2013 recorded music revenues, the music industry and YouTube, the latest at Beats Music, Shuffler FM, Spotify's Times partnership, the latest on ASCAP and BMI's court battles, and much more. DMT's coverage is brought to you by CI, the delivery platform used by leading independent labels, distributors, and aggregators around the world on ci-info.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Leonardi and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And DMT is available as an audio and a video show on a variety of channels, including the iTunes Store, most podcatching apps, including Downcast, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio and AudioBoo. That's always a mouthful. And uh, to get in touch with the show, you can tweet us on at DigiMusicTrends or email us on contact at digitalmusictrends.com. And as you've seen in the intro of this week's show, uh, the podcast is brought to you this week by CI, the leading provider of digital delivery services to the independent community. So go and check them out on ci-info.com as they're helping us keep the light on, uh, lights on for this month. And it's a real pleasure to welcome back three guests, uh, starting with Cristalia Garcia, visiting professor of law at the George Washington University. So hi, Cristalia, and thanks for joining us. How's it going? Hi, I'm very well, thanks. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you back. And uh, also, it's great to have uh, Karim Fanouz uh, back from Music Ally, where he's the head of research. So hi, Karim. How's it going? Hey, Andrea. I'm great. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. And of course, if you don't know about Music Ally, uh, well, if you listen to, the, to this podcast, you really should. So go and check out musically.com for everything uh, about, about the company. And also, they have a really great podcast as well that comes out weekly. And also, it's fantastic to welcome back after an incredibly long absence. I think it's like eight weeks. It's like, wow, <laughs> it's unbelievable. Uh, and Darren Hemmings, founder of digital marketing agency Motive Unknown. Uh, so hey, Darren, thanks for joining me. Hello, good to be here. Sorry about the hat, but it's about minus five in my studio right now. <laughs> I, know. I think uh, myself, uh, you know, Darren and Karim are all in London and there's a, a horrible windstorm and rainstorm, some sort of sleet happening outside. So uh, if we start blowing away in the middle of the show, then you know what, what happened. And, uh, uh, you know... Um, Oh, I was going to mention for Darren, actually, uh, he also compiles a very handy daily digest on the latest news in music tech and digital marketing. Uh, so you can find that on MotiveUnknown.com. Uh, go and sign up. It's a really great resource. And, you know, today we have a lot of ground to cover and not all of it is going to be fun and games. And so I'm going to pretend like I'm doing the commentary of the uh, what was it? The, the uh, snowboarding half pipe. Uh, half that, pipe. I know I'm not cool enough to do that, but you know I'm, I'm going to try and just make it uh, super exciting uh, because I'm going to start by talking about 2013 recorded music revenues from around the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, Italy and France's results came in last week and they were pretty positive. You know, Italy recorded a four percent rise in recorded music revenues, which is pretty impressive considering that Italy has been on a declining slope for quite a long time, and uh, France recorded a two. 0.3% to rise as well. So uh, that's good. Uh, Italy particularly had a good year on the digital front, uh, up 18% with uh, downloads up 6% and uh, uh, physical down only 5%, whilst France was more of a mixed bag because uh, digital was uh, only uh, up 0.6% in terms of revenues, which is kind of odd. And the physical was actually up 1%, which was, uh, you know, com completely counterintuitive. But there you go. Uh, so surprisingly, uh, in Europe, only the UK so far has posted a negative result with a minus 0.06%. Germany is up 1%. Sweden is up 5%. Norway is up 11%. And for the US, we don't really have figures yet. But uh, we do know that overall music sales declined 6.3%, but streaming grew 32%. So uh, you can take that with a pinch of salt. We're, we're going to see the figures, the hard figures when they come in later this year. So first of all, uh, I don't, uh, Darren, do you think that this is starting to shape into a trend for the industry? And, uh, uh, you know, do you think that this is the kind of numbers that the industry was hoping for at this point? Um, I think it's certainly shaping into a trend. I mean, you know, it'd be, it'd be nice to have some positive stories around this where, you know, there's... <laughs> what you know 10 years plus of kind of stuff's gone down type reports yeah um so i think you know the the, the positive responses are good and i and i think they're good for the business as well because i think when you get good you know good news like this kind of thing then people respond positively and perhaps open up a bit more they're not so defensive about the deals they're signing mm -hmm. and you know we might just start to see things 
use the phrase loosen up a bit. It sounds a bit flippant, but y- you know what I mean? As regards, you know, how much um, people are diving into new opportunities and things like that. I mean, we've seen, you know, even at Medem, you know, there was sort of uh, seems to be an even split between people being critical of certain new, you know, tech companies or, uh, you know, new technologies themselves and then others being quite keen to embrace. But, you know, hopefully stories like this will be good for business in that sense of, you know, of, of pushing a bit more of a positive mindset on things. And I think that'd be no bad thing, really, because yeah. I think we've had a very long period of, uh, you know, rather negative talk around revenues and things in particular. So um, as regards whether it's what the music industry wanted to see, I'm I'm not sure. But, uh, you know, I don't sort of work closely enough within that sphere, you know. And uh, I mean, I think independent labels don't see it that way, that, you know, it's it's you know, they're, they're looking at their own bottom line and they're worrying about themselves. So really, the question is whether it's the sort of thing the majors would have wanted to see as, as the sort of biggest stakeholders in the in the industry, as it were. But obviously, I, you know, I'm, I'm not close enough around that to, to really comment. But yeah. I would think it's good news. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, the improvements have to be good news. Right. I mean, it's better than Absolutely. everything went down. So, um <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I think it's good, and I just hope that this will start a bit more of a sort of yeah positive attitude that we'll see uh, a bit more embracing of things and perhaps a bit less, you know, moaning and whining from certain quarters. Yeah. So, uh, and Tom, Kareem, uh, Kareem, Kareem, on your end, like you deal with a lot of international, uh, you know, developments at Musicala, you deal with a lot of different uh, countries and territories and, and labels. Uh, so for you, what does this represent? Is it... Uh, uh, a, a move forward for the industry or is it still a bit of a mixed bag in terms of, sig- of signals right now? I think it's a bit of both and the most important lesson I've learned is to look at every every territory from a local point of view as yeah. well. I mean, I think the it, it, good news in that we had our first rise um, back in 2012 globally, so that was the po- a small rise, you know, 0.2%, but it's still a rise, so there's a recovery going on there. Um, overall, I think the encouraging figure in this lot is the Italian market, which I know quite well. Um, so to see the rise in streaming um, and you know that supporting a market which is traditionally very, very dogged by piracy, that's extremely yeah. encouraging because the problem with the Italian market has always been a very, very bad piracy problem. So to see it recovering and digital driving that is great. Um, so also I think like those massive, are the two uh, things for me. There was also a massive uh, diffidence towards credit cards in Italy as well, which was a problem. Yes, there was that problem there as well. So obviously the culture is changing slightly and, and coming in line with, with you know, perhaps what's happening in the Nordics, which can only be good news in terms of digital and streaming driving the market forward. Yeah, yeah sure. And Cristalia, uh, you keep an eye on, on uh, the international scene as well. And, uh, you know, both from an international standpoint and the U.S., uh, do you think that uh, the industry is on the right uh, path uh, at this point? Uh, and, uh, you know, do you think that uh, record labels, uh, rights holders are, are starting to be uh, more positive and happier about the results that, that uh, streaming services, for example, are posting today? Sure. Well, I think it depends on who you ask. Yeah. Um, I think that there are certainly some some quarters who are expressing um, some optimism around uh, the streaming model. Um, I think the agreement among parties would probably be that it's not where they want it to be yet, but there are some people who are more hopeful that it will get there. Um, and other people, maybe it's less that they're hopeful it'll get there and more that they're more accepting that this is the model that consumers want and that if we want to stay in the game, we're going to need to find ways to work within the model that consumers have expressed a preference for. Um, so I don't know so much that, they, that they're that they happy and they don't want to be selling CDs for eighteen ninety nine, but I think they know that if consumers want this streaming service, they're going to need to, to get in the game and play with it. And, and you've been, we've been seeing, you know, the articles coming about people who have tried different windowing strategies and, and um, uh, the types of artists that it works for and the types of artists who it actually can hurt um, because they're not getting their, their music out uh, when people are looking for it. Um, and I think those kinds of stories um, themselves help to change attitudes around streaming a little bit. Yeah, yeah, sure. And also in, in the last uh, few months, we've seen a bit of a shift in attitude towards uh, uh, Spotify, for example. We've seen people shifting more of the blame uh, on labels for distribution of royalties rather than uh, on uh, Spotify itself. So, Cristalia, on, on your end, uh, it's especially for older artists that are on older contracts, uh, what, what chance do you think they have of renegotiating their, their royalty splits so that they get a better slice of the pie compared to the one that they get today, which is very similar to the, the kind of splits they get um, uh, from the sort of heritage deals uh, that had to do with the uh, physical sales. Right. Well, post 
host m and m I think yeah. uh if they have decent counsel, they have a decent chance of of coming back to the table and renegotiating for <clears throat> rights which they can argue were simply not contemplated at the time that the deals were originally signed yeah. um, the, as as you guys know the, there's vague language to the effect of you know and other distributions in the future, but the um, argument post m M&M is pretty clear that no one anticipated this particular type of streaming um, and i 'd say that the chances are pretty good um, the, the The parties i 'd be more worried about are the new folks coming in who are, um, now that the labels know, uh, they're putting very strict um, uh, splits in there. And, you know, if you're a new artist and you're just trying to get the deal and get the advance, you can record the album, you may accept those terms uh, where later you'll you, you wish that you hadn't done yeah. those. Um, so I think the older artists are, are actually probably in a slightly better position. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, there were a slew of articles actually this week that were quite interesting in the past uh, sort of eight, ten days. Uh, you know, I'll just uh, do a quick round down. For example, Helene Lindvall at The Guardian wrote a great piece focusing on the struggle of Swedish independent labels in spite of an apparent new golden age for recorded music revenues in, in Sweden. Uh, Daniel Norgar posted a mu- musicale, a really uh, thorough, great piece that I'll, I'll link in uh, on the show notes, uh, talking about Norway's struggle in local market where Norwegian artists are losing market share uh, to international ones via via uh, streaming services. And uh, Mark Mulligan on his latest post talked about uh, cannibalization coming from other sources that are not actually uh, music industry sources, but from other entertainment sources. So for example, people decided to spend their money on in- in-app purchases of-, of games rather than on music uh, when they're playing on their mobile devices. So there's a, there's a slew, slew of different opinions out there uh, as to uh, you know how the industry is doing from different perspectives, different size artists, labels, uh, <coughs> uh, national, local approaches as well. So it's really difficult to navigate uh, the space, right? <laughs> it's uh, it's becoming a bit of a headache. Uh, and Karim, uh, on your end, from the Norwegian uh, artist perspective, did you find that quite interesting? Like I found that super interesting to see how the adoption of streaming services also shifted the market share of local artists uh, and and reduced it. Yeah, I think that's been a a problem that people have been worried about for a while, actually, So, which is I was very interested to read Helien's article as well. And people I've been speaking to on the ground, you know, tell me that also when dealing with the streaming model, it's the kind of more niche local um, repertoire artists that really have the concerns because they're per unit kind of revenue is is completely completely turned on its head Um, so I think it's very interesting problem and you know we can't afford to see that music disappear I think the issues there are a few issues I think one of the biggest ones is it's an easy way out but streaming has still not hit anything close to scale and we're all waiting for that to happen if and when it will happen and in what form the models will be you know there's a big debate going on about mid-tier models now as well so I think we just don't know enough, um, but there is a big concern about um, local and niche repertoire, which has to be addressed. I don't know exactly what the, art, the, the answer is at the moment, um, apart from the classic case of looking for, for different, different trickles from other revenue streams, you know, doing as much as you can with D2C to change things and, and, and capitalizing on the live market as well. Um, interestingly, one thing to react to in Helien's article, which I found um, was the uh, attack at Digster. So one of the Indios, Indies had an attack at Digster in curation. Okay, And so perhaps Indian local artists could be doing much more in terms of curation. I mean, I know Digster, if I'm, if I'm right, um, tell me if I'm right, I think it's curated mostly by Universal. Is that right? Um, yes, or, that's right. Or, yeah. So of course there's going to be a problem there, but that's a reason why Indies should jump up and try and give people better curated experiences. Personally, I really like you know the Domino app on Spotify as an example, and there are there are some other great ones. So people should be proactively doing as much as they can to get their music out there on these platforms. <laughs> yeah. If if they find problems with with for example, Digs are just pushing major label content. Yeah, and, and Darren, that's kind of a weird thing that we're, we're seeing right now that. On the one side, we're seeing independent content doing ex- exceeding, exceeding well on uh, streaming services and also talking to Charles Caldas and Medium, they were talking about how, how amazing the market share for independent uh, labels is on streaming services. On the other side, we also hear a lot of uh, uh, independent record labels talk about how little revenues they get from Spotify. And therefore, it feels like those, you know, the benefit of having that exposure on streaming services is somehow negated by the, by the revenues that come off it. So, uh, you know, w- what do you think that they're going to end up standing right, right now? You know, do you hear, you know, working with independent labels, do you still hear mixed uh, feelings about, about streaming right now? Um, I think you get some artists are, are anti. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, I think, as I've said before on here, I think one problem you get is that, you know, the famous artist uh, saying, you know, making negative remarks about <coughs> anything, really. But in this case, you know, streaming services and usually Spotify uh, tends to be the thing that gets a lot of coverage. And, um, you know, a, a lot of people write about that and it gets, you know, it, go, it travels far and wide and other artists pick all that up because it's a, a peer that's made those remarks. The problem is that when, you know, uh, an arguably more informed person who isn't uh, a famous rock star then sort of produces a counterpoint to that. It doesn't really get the coverage and it doesn't tend to reach those artists. So yeah. in my experience, you see quite a lot of artists are, are often kind of filled with, you know, a degree of bad wisdom. And whenever I've had these conversations with artists, um, they're, they're almost always sort of a bit misinformed. Yeah, um, but on the label side, like I think, you know, artists is a, it's kind of a difficult issue because it's a very personal issue. But when you're talking about hard hitting business numbers, mm. money, I think mm. like labels are probably a better, a better barometer of what's happening here. You know, do you feel like they are now embracing streaming in spite of the kind of mismatch in revenues right now? And I'm just hoping that, uh, as Karim said, there's going to be volume eventually in sort of a year's time that's going to bring revenues in. Um, I have to be honest, you know, the... The labels that I have, you know, had any dealings with or just had conversations with over the last 12 months, um, damn near every one of them is is really happy with the money they're getting back from Spotify. You know, they're actually, right. you know, it's becoming, I think it's probably safe to say that across the board, it's, it's probably now becoming kind of like the number two revenue stream after iTunes. You know, and it, I mean, yes, there's a drop off, <laughs> you know, it's not like it's literally nipping at the heels of your iTunes income. But, you know, they're all seeing that it counts for a surprising amount. And equally, I think the thing that a lot of them are raising their eyebrows on is then seeing what they get paid by YouTube, because that seems to have not really featured in this discussion. You know, everyone's so busy bashing Spotify and co that they seem to be totally missing that, you know, they got millions of views on YouTube and only got paid about a quarter or less of what they got from Spotify. So, yeah. It's all relative, and it's kind of like, yes, against iTunes revenue, Spotify at first seemed pretty lame. Now it looks like because of the volume of use and things like that, you know, and, it, and it's a pretty ballsy move that Spotify have made with the kind of free model now that's that's really kind of reducing those barriers to uh, to, to usage, you know, and adoption. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I have to say most of the, the people I talk to, and, I, you know, and to be clear, you know, I think indie is a very broad term, you know, there's yeah. there's there's you know excel is an indie beggars are an indie but they're massive you know <laughs> they're really big uh, and then you get very very small indies but yeah across the board most of them that i and it's only anecdotal obviously it's only the people of i've talked to so, but yeah. they, you know they have been very positive about it and i yeah. think it probably doesn't you know it's, it's quite sad that at the moment we're seeing this kind of lines of division that seem to be getting built up by someone so it's like if it's not spotify it's the labels you know it's like it's like there's a million artists around the corner with you know pitchforks and, and flaming torches yeah. all just looking for someone to to lynch on this one but yeah talk to any label i know and actually they're all pretty pleased with how it's going and talking That's about rosy. talking about artists with pitchforks uh Christalia, I, I wanted to bring up uh meet them and uh, uh one of the key sort of uh hot Thoughts of media in terms of subjects was uh, uh, the relationship between the music industry and Google, uh, yeah. and that was kind of interesting because it really raised uh, some uh, some tempers in the room. Sometimes, you know, in some panels uh, when Google was involved, artists calling into question the revenues coming from YouTube, calling into question Google's inaction when it comes to uh, deranking sites that promote piracy or uh, deranking uh, sites that allow you to rip YouTube videos as MP3s. Uh, so th th there are a lot of uh, you know. Uh, discussions around that uh which uh you know it made it kind of uh, it it showed that there is still a lot of tension between the two parties essentially between youtube google and the music industry so uh, from your end from from a, from a legal standpoint as well as a sort of a, a rights standpoint uh, how do you think that the relationship is going to progress do you think that at this point you know the cards are drawn and the industry has got you know has, has got the cards that it's got and it can't do much more on that front or do you think there is still some room for negotiation and for increasing those rates uh, uh, not purely uh, relating to to volumes but also to the, the rates themselves right um i hope that there's still some room for negotiation uh this is the 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 
the, the framing of this debate where it's technology versus artists, um, I think is really unfortunate. Yeah. And um, as we've been, uh, you know, as I'm here in DC and I've been att able to attend a lot of the copyright hearings that the subcommittee on IP holds, um, it's so marked that when the committee, for example, holds the hearings, um, as I think I've mentioned, they'll often have two separate days. So they'll have sort of the, the artist labels day questionable whether they should even be doing it that way but they'll have like the you know the content day one day and technology on a separate day as if they're presenting entirely different you know um, positions which they often are um, but th as if they're not you know, talking about the same services. And I think, um, I'm hopeful that there will be some room for movement, especially as there begins to be a little bit more of um, an acceptance and an embracing within the music industry um, that there is, um, that the future really lies with these technologies. At the same time, I think that um, Google and YouTube and other technologies of that sort that are, that are emerging and that are working in the content space could do a much better job of recognizing the role that content plays in supporting their businesses. Um, from the artists that I've talked to, you know, I'm working on this artist copyright project where I'm interviewing a bunch of different artists. From, from the folks I've spoken to, the biggest issue from artists, this isn't even labels, but artists themselves, is that they feel that they, this unfairness about not making money off the advertising that's um, being uh, thrown around their content, right? So I think part of this has to do with Google and YouTube. Maybe maybe they just need to make a, a more public recognition of the role that content's playing in building their business and then um, make some, you know, substantive moves towards accommodating artists financially for the role that they're playing in this. Um, so it may be the case that for UGC, uh, they have some, you know, paltry rate, and that's fine for someone's toddler, you know, dancing around their house. But for the music videos, we need to see different rates and different payments and different structures and a recognition that this is a very different type of type of beast than, than UGC. This is, you know, content that costs money to make, um, and it should be compensated differently than content that someone filmed on their iPhone. And I think that's kind of the missing link. There's just this, um, this, this assumption that the two parties are working against each other, which is a dangerous one because I think there could be great things done between YouTube and, and, and the content world um, if they were able to sort of uh, find common ground around the recognition that um, both of the parties are truly interdependent and one could not be running their business without the other. Yeah, absolutely. Karim, uh, anything to comment on that? Yeah, a couple, couple of things. I think I'm just talking, of, you know, headline grabbing um, sort of numbers. I think the interesting thing was, wasn't it said that uh, YouTube has played nearly a billion dollars to rights holders? And yeah. that's the same that Spotify is apparently approaching in markedly different uh, ranges of time and also with massively different user bases. So it is interesting that that debate is now shifting to YouTube rather than the streaming services. Um, and it's interesting also that Darren said for many people, um, streaming is now becoming the second digital revenue stream sort of in front of YouTube. So there's a lot of, there is a lot of tide change here. Um, and I think the next, the next few months are going to be really interesting. Uh, and I just wanted to add a couple of things to the indie, the indie debate as well. Sure, the services are trying. I think that's very important too. Um, you know, Charles Caldas is very happy with the deal Merlin got with Beats. And I think that says a lot as well about how opinions are changing and attitudes are changing. And at the same time, Spotify, I think Billy Bragg is, it, is doing a radio show which is about un uncovering obscure sort of tracks on Spotify. Yep. And there was a great app called Forgetify that came out the other yeah. day, which um, previews all of the tracks that, you know, nobody's really listened to on Spotify. So there's a lot happening there. Um, as well, which I think is important to consider. And one thing that's close to my heart, though, that's important to raise is that I think what really suffers in all of these um, foreign territories as well uh, and is important to be aware of is it's the local language stuff, the more traditional yeah. local language repertoire that is, is losing that higher per unit revenue. That's, those stars of music are coming, are really heading into trouble, I think, and the, the rights holders and writers and performers are extremely worried. And I think that's something that for the moment maybe can only be propped up or helped by you know, government bodies or agencies, and they, they need to be looked after while we're going through this transition. I think that's something that's that people don't think about. I know it's very specialist, but it's kind of close to close to my heart to think about that sort sense. of stuff too. Yeah, absolutely. That makes that makes a, a, a heap of sense. And uh, and uh, you know, talking about uh, you know, you mentioned beats music, and of course, uh, 
uh, I guess uh, everybody's happy with the deal the Beats music is giving out because it's the same deal for everybody. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I mean, that, that's that's kind of a, a groundbreaking thing uh, as far as uh, as far as rates are concerned. But let's talk about that in a second. First of all, Darren, I want to ask you about the marketing side of things. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, the Beats rolled out um, an advert. Uh, we didn't manage to talk about it on the show because uh, we had the Medium episode last week, um, and uh, they rolled out an advert at the Super Bowl with uh, Alan DeGeneres, a massive thing. You know, spent loads of money. Uh, you know, how do you think they're going about this uh, this rollout, and you know, how do you feel about it right now? Um, I mean, I, I I want them to succeed, I really do. Uh, but I must admit, I I find their pitch a bit odd, a bit weird. I mean, you know, we've talked about this quite a lot in the past, and I've, you know, especially around the whole aspect of music discovery and kind of, you know, I think I've said a few times before that I, you know, I think really uh most people just want to hear some music and the right. you know the sad fact is that you know the majority of people are just kind of want a good stream of music they're not so fussed necessarily about these kind of very granular me- mechanisms to to control what they discover and and things like that which i think is why radio you know certainly in the uk radio is you know is, is absolutely the kingmaker and is the thing that can you know reaches that many people it it still has a huge effect and in the states i think the pickup of, of more radio based services whether it was the success of Sirius initially or Pandora and now you know those sorts of things all suggest that really people you know my view is that people are probably just wanting some music and they're you know they don't want to think that hard about what they get and I think you know the things that beats are pushing like this kind of slightly weird you know wordy thing about you know I want to listen to something jaunty while I'm rowing through Venice in the in the in the rain or whatever you know it's just sort of the Mad Lib. <laughs> yeah, it's you know, it's it's just like um, yeah, you know, I don't go running towards that. They go, oh my god, I've got to give that a go. I'm just sort of looking at it thinking, really? Yeah. Like, it's kind of so. I, I just it's I think the, the and the reason I find it odd is because it's slightly at odds with the rest of the advertising and positioning. You know, they've they've obviously spent a lot of money getting um, Ellen involved and. You know, that whole ad was sort of involving her and was quite kind of light in tone and all these things. And yet it's, you know, it's beats and, and, you know, they maintain that there's this, you know, what they call prosumer sort of tier of of market, you know, of the person who likes good quality things and and all of that stuff. But I think the other thorn in their side is that while they're sort of doing this with a one week free trial, you know, Spotify and Audio promptly dumped all of the the fees around access. You know, and said, look, if you want to listen, you know, if you're on a tablet, and God knows that, you know, there's a lot of kids now waving around, you know, Nexus Sevens, and you know, with the cheaper tablets that are flooding the market, you know, and, and they've all got access to it when it's free. So, I, I just worry about who they're talking to, and how much those people are going to make a decision to use Beats when, really, at the end of the day, you know, the couple of sort of big exclusive acts notwithstanding you know these services are all fairly on you know on the same level you know the catalog is pretty much identical for all of them the feature sets are just sort of how much you care really but i think in terms of which way people swing i would imagine the number one factor will be you know price and things like that and uh, and at that point at the moment you know spotify are certainly appealing to the person that likes a bit of radio more because they're sort of saying well you can have it with ads and that's basically a radio experience anyway so, you know, a radio experience with a bit more choice sounds pretty good to me for yeah. nothing. Um, <laughs> and in the face of that, you know, I just think Beats will struggle. And, you know, and the sort of grandiose gestures of, you know, blowing $4 million or whatever it was on the ad thing just made me kind of sit there and think, well, you know, are we meant to be impressed by that? I don't know. Like, I've seen no mention of a surge in signups post Super Bowl or anything else. It's. I find it all a bit odd. Yeah, again, um, it was it was another advert though where they didn't really explain what Beats does. It was a very nice, nicely done advert, but it didn't really explain the service, which I guess makes sense because it's an entertainment advert for the Super Bowl. So I guess whether it's a cornerstone piece of a of an awareness campaign that's going to be ongoing for the rest of the year, and that sort of lays the the sort of the grounds for that conversation going forward. I don't think that based on the average people would go, oh yeah, Beats is of course is a new streaming service, service that I'm going to be able to sign up to and all that kind yeah, of stuff. It's, it's, it's kind of it, it wasn't it wasn't clear. Everything about it is just a bit sort of muddled. Yeah. You know, waving around Trent Reznor and saying, well, he's our creative director, and you know, we pay artists very well, or we pay the rights holders, and the indies get all this stuff, but 
that's fantastic if like us you know you're involved in the music business but the man in the street is sort of you know over decades of piracy has kind of proven that he doesn't really care a great deal about those things you know it's not high on on joe public's agenda to feel good that they're supporting a more ethical service you know and yeah. so I'd, i just find it all a bit confused i would yeah. like it to succeed i mean i think it's amazing that they're paying the same rates and they haven't tried to kind of screw over the indies and things like that that is totally admirable and they've got some really good people there yeah, but sure. i just find it a slightly odd pitch and, and Christelia, i, I want to take your uh, hear your thoughts on a couple of things first of all how the hell did they manage to get uh, majors to come on board with the same rate for everybody? Because that's a, certainly must have been a tough conversation. And uh, so what, what do you think about that? And also, what do you think about the AT&T partnership on that front? No, no pressure, Cristelia. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I can't speak directly to having that major labels <laughs> oh, on course, board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I would suspect that uh, having certainly having Jimmy at the head doesn't hurt. Um, in terms of getting Universal on board, and as we've now learned, if Universal's on board, it doesn't take too much to get get, get the other folks to to fall in line. Um, just building on what Darren was saying, I think that what Beats is really going for here to 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 answer the question about the AT and T is is a bundled play, and that's where they're really distinguishing themselves from Spotify. And I think that AT and T is only the beginning. Um, my uh, my impression is that. Uh, uh, the reason that the uh, Ellen DeGeneres commercials kind of was like it was, and we might agree, it's kind of a family-friendly commercial, not only because it was done during the Super Bowl, but there's like the Three Little Bears, and we had Daddy's music, and we had Mommy's music, right? And that's not an accident, right? They want families of four or five who have AT&T accounts. It's $15 a month for up to five people to be on the service. So while it's not free, it's practically free. <laughs> you know, it's, it's as close to free as you can get if you get five people on there. Um, and I think what 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 Beats is making a bet on is not the freeloading teenagers with their tablets who want free, you know, service where they take an app to. They want the families who don't care about an extra fifteen dollars a month on their phone bill, which is already several hundred dollars for for the kids and their texts and what and whatnot to get on these services, um, they're really making bu a bundling play. So, you know, AT&T for now, but once they've got Verizon and Sprint and T-Mobile and so forth, um, an extra 15 bucks on everyone's, um, you know, account. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to even see individuals eventually just kind of getting on there and you want to throw $15, that's like tax, you know, fine. Then I have Beats on my phone and, and it seems like it's free to me because I'm paying a phone bill, I'm not paying a Beats bill. Um, you know, I remember when, when I was doing digital strategy a big part of this whole bundling thing was because no one would know they were paying it, right? That's that's the beauty of the fees. So there's like a, a music fee, um, but it's part of the phone bill. And if you have any sort of qualm with it, you feel like you have a qualm with AT&T, not with Beats, right? And uh, I think that that's the big bundling play. Um, so, you know, I think that they're going for families and they're going for bundling. They want people to be uh, maybe paying for these services without even realizing that they're paying for them. Yeah. Yeah, Kareem, what are your thoughts on Beats and the, and the strategy and, and their marketing so far? Yeah, I think what Chris Sola just said is really, really interesting, especially about the family plan. I mean, because that, that, that delivers a nice message about music as well, doesn't it? It does actually make the cost virtually, you know, much, seem much lower, and it delivers a message as, you know, music is for the family, it's for everyone. We're opening it up here. Netflix have done interesting stuff with that as well, which has brought a lot of people on board, as, as far as I understand. Um, I I wonder. I've just been thinking: is is what we're talking about at odds with their basic brand strength? That that's interesting to me because what I was going to give a nod to, perhaps, is is beats. You know, let's not forget; it does have that cool image um, to do with the ambassadors and to do with the headphones and the music equipment. Um, you know, it's got basketball players on on board doing a lot of um, playlists, curated playlists. So I, uh, you know, that is a strength for the service and we shouldn't underestimate how much that appeals to the kind of cool consumers who want the trainers, who want to buy into that stuff. And, you know, we've all said that. We've all been aware from that for the beginning. But I actually ask back to you guys, what do you think? Does, does that, how does that fit with the Ellen advert? Does that actually go hand in hand or does that confuse the image a little bit? Well, I think, I mean, this is the problem though. And I mean, you know, going back to Cristelia's point as, as well about, um, bundling you know this has been done in the uk and you know mm. deezer did all this and it and really audio didn't, as well yeah. yeah it didn't get a huge amount of traction at all you know and it kicked off a huge fight with deezer about you know they promptly claimed that they had x many 
users but when the questions were asked about how many were kind of actively using the service everyone everyone suddenly went quiet you know because you were bundling it in but you know when when it is a bundle such that you literally just get it for free because you're paying your regular way then i think what you're seeing is that people are getting it but they're not valuing it because it's just coming with the service um but equally elsewhere you know you're then seeing people not wanting to pay as much as you know five pounds extra a month for this stuff because they just don't value music that much you know that's the sad reality of it is we've reached that point where people kind of grumble you know i sit around mm. my friends and we all feel a bit sad about the fact that at some point charging you know paying 10 pounds a month for access to damn near all the music ever made is apparently too much you know <laughs> and people like but don't like me you know when i used to work for sony music i'd pop out for lunch when i lived you know in, when i was working in soho rather you know, and you come back from lunch with like 60 quid's worth of vinyl under your arm because there were so <laughs> many great shops. And so it's, you know, it's all very relative, but it is quite strange that, you know, I don't think the bundling is like an absolute guarantee that people will go running towards it. And, and I do agree with you, Kareem, that I think as something that's, that's always said that they aim for this prosumer level, you know, if it's going to become a thing that kind of comes with a bunch of, you know, uh, mobile bundles or whatever, then yes, I think there's a very ser serious risk that it could then start to devalue it. And it also raises a question that I think Mark Mulligan was the first to kind of put forward, which was like, why have they not really s sought to make a, a real connection with the headphones? Because at the moment, mm. it's kind of like headphones are over there and Beats Music's over here. And I'd, I'm not seeing any kind of overt attempt to push the two together but yeah who knows? That, that would be so strong i agree with you that that would be so strong bundling it with headphones or they've got the link is what's the technology do they uh does it come embedded on the new beats pill the actual service in the same way that spotify connect works possibly yeah it i think that may, that did, may be right? interesting yeah but it, like you say it's it's interesting they haven't gone they haven't aligned the headphones with the service yet i'm i assume mm. they might it's gotta um, happen it's gotta yeah. happen i mean mm. that, that would be silly otherwise and uh, it does raise another question what you just said darren about well how much are people prepared to pay for music anymore full stop and that's something andrea raised at the beginning as well in one of the pieces i think it's mark mulligan um who was saying there's much less of a spend now and and um He's analysed the different spends, and music is is certainly getting squeezed. So I think that comes into play here as well. You know, it is sad we used to spend so much more on music, but how much are people prepared to spend nowadays, and what's it competing with? Yeah. It's the big you know, it's, it's that five pound thing. I mean, if you're saying it's fifteen dollars for the family, well, you know, equally there's things like Netflix and Love Film and all these kinds of video services that are asking similar amounts. And that's mm. a family-wide thing because you're basically buying it for the household, if you like. Mm. Uh, you know, it's something that you'd all sit around and watch or whatever. And, you know, and they're, I mean, they're seeing good traction, but by no means like a you know massive uptake either. So I think we have to be a little bit careful about, you know, prices and, and thinking, well, if it's this much, why wouldn't you? Because weirdly, people won't. I mean, God, you know, you're in realms of literally, you know, is it that? Is it music for a month or a, or a Starbucks? And it would mm. appear that a lot of people are would prefer the cup of coffee yeah which is yeah. kind of sad but <laughs> this this does look bad you know yeah yeah and this does link back as well to the principle of wallet share as well there was a prs study that i think tracked music's percentage of of the spend of each person you know of wallet share and it's just basically been decreasing steadily for many 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 years and that is one thing that streaming can bring back to the table you know it can anchor music back in our wallets as long yeah. as it does get to this scale it's that i think that's a very important thing that it can achieve eventually no, I was all there. And also, I think there's a very different scale of spend between the US and the UK. As Christelle was pointing out, I think uh, in the US, uh, carriers and also cable companies have managed to keep prices very high up until now, both of broadband and of cable access. So as she was saying, you know, for a family of four or five, it could easily be like three, four hundred dollars a month spent on cable and mobile bills and whatever. So 15 bucks is actually really not that much. In the UK, I think we have a different pricing structure now for for well, this sort of thing, unless you're a Sky subscriber, like mm. heavy-handed on sports and you spend maybe like 18, 90 pounds a month on getting the full package from Sky. But, you know, we're still not talking anywhere near as much as what it costs in the US to get a similar type of, uh, of coverage. So uh, I guess, you know, in the monetary sense, maybe in the US it's less painful than it is in the UK to add a $15 charge to the bill. But uh, mm. that's maybe just uh, my two, pence in it, two cents in it. 
<laughs> and uh, or, or fifteen dollars, fifteen dollars, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, we're talking about bundling. One thing, one thing that was interesting this week was actually Spotify launched a, a, a bundling in with the, uh, the Sunday Times and the Times. So it's a uh, from what they've said, it's the first partnership of this kind. Uh, they've uh, uh, essentially, if you subscribe to the Sunday Times or the Times for a year. Uh, which I think it starts the the cheapest subscription for, just for the Sunday Times is about three hundred pounds uh, a year or so, somewhere around those lines. Um, you get a free premium Spotify subscription for the year as well, in, included in that. So uh, some people have compared it to like you know the the free radio that you used to get in the nineties when you subscribe to to a paper for for the year, or you know the free gift that you got, and and now it's okay. Spotify. But of course the value is interesting because uh, the value of a subscription is one hundred twenty pounds uh, here in the UK. Uh, which uh, both lowers the uh, perceived amount that you're spending on the time subscription and it perhaps will get more time subscribers to adopt Spotify as a streaming service, as a service of choice uh, without really having to do anything about it. And, and then perhaps if the deal expires next year, they will actually start paying for it because it's, they, they got addicted to it or they saw it as good value. So, uh, yeah, I, I wonder if that's going to be like something that Spotify pursues more uh, in terms of deals. And if we're going to see more magazines and newspapers tie in with streaming services, like we've seen with uh, with uh, with um, uh, carriers, so uh, Karim, do you think that that might be the case, and we might see more of that? Yeah, I think it is. I think we're looking at different distribution points, and and I think it's a really interesting deal. I mean, I I actually consider it myself because you get access online to the paywall content, yeah. and you get free Spotify. So, but I think the most important thing is what you said. It's just that it's that stamp. It's that space in people's minds. It's the eyeballs on the Spotify logo, and the fact that it's there. So it's just getting people used to what Spotify is, and and bringing them into that world. Um, and I think we will see more stuff like that. I think people in all sort in in all territories are looking at all sorts of flexible deals like this. You know, Deezer has one with one of the local radio stations in Spain, for example. And that's to, to, to help, um, you know, get people to know Deezer via the radio station channel and um, it'll help the channel with information about what people are listening to to help it put stuff on, on its, um, you know, uh, on the air playlist. So yeah. services are looking at partnerships all across the board. Um, and I think in, for newspapers, this stuff is really interesting because they are treading very new ground as well, you know, losing print, print readers and <laughs> looking at how to transition online and getting people to pay. And yeah. so if you can bundle this kind of thing with it, it's, it's very attractive. Uh, Cristalia, uh, in the US especially, you know, the print industry is really struggling in newspapers. Do you think that we could see a New York Times plus Spotify subscription, a bundle in of, of those two? Uh, certainly possible. I, what I think is sort of the most interesting angle here uh, is that, you know, I, my take on this is that this is a play to bring in a different demographic, right? So um, the current mm -hmm. Spotify user is, you know, um, people who are music people and then it's young people who are you know tech savvy and e early adapter type folks um, and then uh, some passive listeners whose friends told them to do it but it's not my mom and my dad and it's certainly not my grandma but those are the types of people or my neighbor or someone's teacher at school those are the people who will be subscribing to the newspapers right and so they may be exposed to Spotify in a way that they never would have sought out on their own but since it was given to them they check it out and this is a chance to say hey you know, older folks, uh, less tech savvy folks, um, check us out. It's free. Uh, you know, maybe you have a year to figure out how it works. And if you decide you like it, then you, then you can stick with it. Um, so I, I like it. I'd love to see, to see more bundles of this sort. You know, I had an initial, a little bit of an initial hesitation for these, um, types of bundles where uh, you're paying for the newspaper and you're getting the music for free. My, my question was, well, this just reinforces that music is free. Um, this this mm. price tag on, on music is still zero and the newspaper costs whatever it costs. Um, and then when the year ends, are people going to be willing to pay for something that they now think of as being free? Um, but, you know, I think, you know, I've talked to, I've had enough people, I think, try to convince me that this is, you know, this is not so different from, you know, people giving you a free coconut water. It doesn't mean you think you're never going to have to buy it again. It just gives you a chance to try it out. Um, a full year is a really long time to try something out. Um, but, you know, maybe they figure this is the best way to really get in a demographic who otherwise are simply not going to do it. And they, they, maybe they need more than a free month to figure it out or seven days, as if you're in Beat's case, to figure out if you like something or not. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I think it, I think it's it's a, it's a really nice way to reach a different demographic. Yeah, it makes sense. Like what you said about uh, trying to educate people as well. Like one of the big keys in, into the success of this program is going to be whether uh, the Times does enough education with their readership to 
allow people that might not necessarily know what Spotify is or how it works to actually get into it because that's really the the key barrier to getting people to adopt something is to actually get them to try it out for the first time. And so, so that's going to sure. be the key. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I imagine if you tell my uncle like, Hey, you got a free Spotify subscription. He has no idea what that means yeah. or, or, or what to do with it. So there's going to have to be a little bit more, um, and, and you know, I'm sure Spotify is on this, but there's going to be, need to be a little bit more literature and, and, or follow up with the folks who, who get this so that they can actually make use of it. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I think I think that's that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about it in that way yet as well. And the fact that the Times demographic might be slightly different to, let's say, your your Guardian demographic. Mm-hmm. The interesting thing about the year period is Rob Wells, I think, a while back said that there was a six month inflection point when you become so embedded in a service that you you start to feel it's essential. You know, you've got you've got all your playlists. You're used to it. So then, I suppose the year gives people two or three months to understand what it is first get drawn in and then start creating the playlist and so they yeah. need that whole year that's to really, upsell them yeah absolutely well that's going to be quite fun to to see what happens with that and if we're going to see more deals of this kind coming in and uh, i wanted to just quickly cover a shuffler so uh, darren shuffler has just launched a new uh, app a magazine uh, called uh, pause if i'm not uh, mistaken uh, and uh, they uh, it's an ipad app it's a magazine uh, that's going to come out quarterly it's uh, boils down essentially the best of the best uh, the first edition is on uh, 2013's best uh, music and uh, artists uh, releases uh, compilations all sorts of stuff essentially and uh, it, it ties in with the uh, shuffle fm's radio and you can do all sorts of stuff with it uh, and uh, 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 they also announced a partnership with Sonos now, so you can actually access Shuffler.fm uh, via your Sonos device, which is a great win for them because uh, it means that more people are going to be able to access to it, uh, especially the ones that are choosing Sonos as their system of choice in the, in the home. Uh, so, yeah, lots of stuff happening there. You know, how, how do you like the app? Um, I haven't used the app. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've had like Steve O'Reilly and Tim and, and all the guys sort of telling me very excitedly about the app. Unfortunately, <laughs> It's an iPad app, and uh, right. I only have an iPad one, so it's it's it getting work. no love from me. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, I'm sure it's great. I mean, uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of of Shuffler. Um, you know, big fan of Tim in particular. I think he's a, a smart guy. You know, and with Stephen on board now, you know, it's a they they've got you know a really good little team together there in terms of you know you won't beat them for enthusiasm. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're really super passionate. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I must confess, haven't tried it. Think the idea is brilliant. Uh, my one sort of marketing comment was that I didn't I'd, personally. I kind of wish they hadn't have launched it with a retrospective because it's February now, and retrospective sort of a more December, very early January type thing. Um, small complaint, frankly, because I think from here on, you know, they'll 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 uh, continue to churn out good stuff. But yeah. um, but I have to say, for me, the big news because my house is entirely sort of Sonos. Uh, driven at the moment um is is their arrival on there which is absolutely awesome uh and it's weird because it made me realize something a a little bit pathetic but quite interesting which is that you know when these services latch into something like sonos which i use and i mean sonos isn't the only thing in my house we have you know hi-fi and typically i suppose given what i do for a living there's sort of no end of ways to play music in this place but um it's interesting when something like Shuffler lands on on Sonos because you just find yourself using it so mm-hmm. much more because the reality is that day to day I use Sonos for the bulk of my listening. You know, right. uh, it's what's you know it's what's on in my office all the time, and so it's permanently on. and And they've they've got a really nice sweet spot there in that you know you have a million music services you can plug in, whether it's Spotify, audio, take your pick. You know, they're all the same really. Um, then you get, you know, you've got Hype Machine as well, which is very good at rounding up kind of the best music from the blogs and things like that, which is kind of what I use it for on Sonos. Yeah. Um, you tend to gravitate to the sort of chart end of it. Um, whereas Shuffler gives you a, a really kind of cool way of either digging through, you know, charts of most popular things and stuff like that, but more on the kind of radio side where you can just pick a genre and have it, you know, play things. But it's also worth noting that the way they've integrated it is very smart because the radio experiences on Sonos from the likes of audio just show you what's currently playing, but they don't sort of show you what's being played and they don't show what's coming out. So basically they don't work with the playlist system that kind of drives Sonos. Like if you play an album on Sonos, it creates a playlist for your album and then plays it. Uh, When it's radio, it's literally just taking one track at a time and spoon feeding them in the shuffler. I've noticed today because of, 
pretty much just had to turn it off to do this. You know, it's been on all, you know, since I got up this morning. Um, it's great because it's a bit like Google Play Music when you tell that to just play you some radio, where it's creating a kind of a never ending playlist. But because it's all there, you can see what it played hours ago as well, you know, and you've got that option of digging back to find the songs you love. So I have to say, it's one of those, you know, really sublime matches where you're just looking at it going, this. This will transform, you know, Shuffler's, you know, my use of Shuffler. But I think it would also get real adoption because it's actually occupying a space. I mean, I, I you know, there's American services I, I don't use. I'm, I'm not sure if Songs Are is on there and obviously maybe that Pandora is bolted yeah. on and things like that. But here in the UK where you haven't got those kind of services, it's it's really good. You know, and now, you know, I mean, Last FM is there, but it's not something I've found much value in uh, on Sonos. But yeah. Shuffler is... Is really hitting the spot. So um, haven't used the magazine app, but to be honest, I feel like that's sort of pulling up second to the Sonos thing. That's great. Actually, because I'm know, a Sonos I, user. I think I think there's more people that would have tried the magazine app at this point, like myself, than people that would have used the Sonos thing yet. So uh, that's that's great that you had that that testimony on, on that front. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean the, the, the magazine app is, is really great. It works it works brilliantly, and uh, you know, it's a slick experience. Lots of Nice content, you know, good retrospective on 2013, lots of cool sources. So not no complaints there. It's, it's a really nice app and it's, it's nicely made. So uh, definitely looking forward to see what they're going to do for the rest of the year with that. And I guess you know the retrospective side of things is probably due to the, the development deadlines that probably got dragged through, <laughs> ended up. Uh, yeah, no, <laughs> ended no, up but in I think it's, it's you know like all the great ideas, they're they're very simple in their execution and yeah. it's little things like I don't I don't you know I don't, I don't to be honest I don't have time to sit and kind of obsessively read every music site out there um but the fact that shuffler is kind of pulling together the audio that these sites are posting and then providing them so that if you don't want to say just play me some shoegaze radio or something you could say actually i just want to hear the music that drowned in sound are are posting up then it's a it's kind of a way of listening to those sites which is again it's kind of simple but i think it's very effective you know and it gives you that connection um and and so yeah I, I mean i have to say i'm i'm really really impressed with it i was a huge fan of shuffler's uh apps on mobile anyway um it's one of the apps i kind of miss from switching over to to android um but you know that and i think shuffler and discover were about the only two that i really did use to find music because they were a very reliable way of just sort of surfacing things yeah. that you fancied and yeah. it's sort of it is weird that there's not many radio experiences that I'm seeing where you can sit there and say, you know what, I fancy a bit of, you know, underground hip hop and it will yeah. just sit there and spoon up a load of it. So it's great. Yeah. Love it. Awesome. Christiane, do you know uh, Shuffer? I, I don't know. I, I keep thinking of it as a, as a European startup, so I just have no idea what kind of footprint they had in the States, if any. Yeah. Um, so I, I do know of it, but I think I'm probably ex- the exception to the rule because yeah. I'm engaged in the world and and the big uh, music dork. Um, so I so I know it, but it doesn't have much penetration in the states. I think um, it, there's certainly a market for it, but as as is the case, no doubt in Europe, it's it's a really it's a niche market, right? It's it's folks like me um, who would who would think, oh wow, like a retrospect magazine this is this is great um but there's not a lot of us and so i think um as with most of the services that come to the u.s market if there's not um you know tons of advertising to be sold around it it's going to be slow to gain penetration it's going to be slow to to get in front of people um i didn't know that it was on sonos now so i'm all excited and as soon as we're done here i'm going to go and try to check that out and see if i can make it make it work um i I, i'm with darren anything that's on sonos is going to increase my listenership considerably um because I'm going to have it on and just leave it on while I'm while I'm working, um, and as much as I like to think of myself as an active listener, you know the passive listening that's that uh, Sonos allows um, through any of the apps that are on it are is really perfect uh, when I have to do other things. So yeah, yeah. and Karima, how how do you see the future for for Shuffer at, at this point? You know, are they going to gain a new market share through the Sonos partnership and and start expanding from that? Yeah, I mean, I think what we're saying is, is what, what, what what Darren and Cristelli have said is really interesting and absolutely highlights the advantages to hardware partnerships. They're still really there. I mean, I think uh, I haven't been able to try the app disgracefully. I only have an iPad 1 as well, so I need to upgrade, uh, but I'm a big fan of Shuffler. Um, but just to draw on the hardware partnership thing, I, I mean, it sounds like a big advantage advantage for them and it reminds me someone I know um, slightly older than me um, uh, and their family all use Napster and I said why when I saw them the other day I said you know that's kind of unheard of in 
in the UK. And I said, well, how did that come about? You know, you're going to try Spotify, you're going to try uh, RDO or any of the others. He's like, no, you know, it came on Sonos. We, we love it. We use it. All our playlists are there now. And we're just going to keep using it. And so that just reminded me of that example as well. Yeah. Uh, hardware partnerships, distribution is still very, very important. I think that's the takeaway. Absolutely. And Cristalia, I can't let you go. Uh, I'm going to start uh, wrapping up the show, but I can't let you go without talking about uh, Pandora. So, you know, uh, there's uh, sure. so much stuff happening uh, in the States right now. So just to do a very quick, you know, sort of summary of what's going on for, for the listeners that might not have been following the story. So, uh, you know, uh, ASCAP and BMI essentially have both uh, had uh, rulings, separate rulings at the end of 2013, uh, stating that uh, publishers could not withdraw uh, their digital rights from the organizations without violating the consent decree, which uh, BMI argues is completely outdated, having been signed in 1941. So publishers like Sony TV and UMPG have, uh, that had withdrawn their digital rights from uh, those organizations uh, in order to do the, a direct deal with Pandora and other services like Pandora, uh, now found that they had to rejoin, essentially, uh, until uh, maybe the consent decree is modified by the courts. And also, at the same time, there is uh, a battle going on on rates uh, uh, with the Pandora, also court-led. Uh, and uh, again, ASCAP and BMI are operating in two different courtrooms uh, separately, which is kind of bizarre because they have two different judges that are looking at this thing, and they could actually, in theory, get two, two different uh, um, decisions on, on what's going to happen on that. So, uh, you know, you're probably the only, the only one of the four of us that can talk sensibly about this, but it's just, uh, you know, feeling the pulse of what's happening in the States right now, do you feel like uh, it's just a complete mess? Or do you feel like uh, <laughs> things are getting slightly organized in the wake of this uh, ruling at the end of 2013, and people sort of now understand, okay, no, so this is happening, this is what we have to do, this is what's going to have to happen, essentially. And, and at the same time, uh, that, you know, they're going to have success in uh, getting this consent decree changed so that mm. the big publishers can withdraw their digital rights from, from the main collection organizations in the, in the States. So the short answer to your question is, it, is it a giant mess is yes. Yeah. Um, of course, of course, it's a giant mess. Uh, you know, as, as I tried to explain it, it's so, impossible. So, so nothing, nothing, nothing's changed on that end. What I think is particularly interesting here, um, and just you know, I think uh, Andrea did a great job summarizing it. But for the viewers, effectively, what's happening here is there are these consent decrees that were originally put in place to keep ASCAP and BMI from acting as monopolies, right? From um, you know, this was an, an attempt so that they couldn't throw their weight around and and you know, charge anything they wanted to the people who needed access to the content. Um, so is the consent decree that was originally entered in 1941 outdated? Of course it is. But it's a bit disingenuous for BMI and ASCAP to suggest that it was set in 1941 and hasn't been touched then because it is constantly uh, updated and constantly revised and constantly monitored by the courts. The Southern District of New York, which is the, the rate court in charge of, of, of monitoring these all the time, um, what the original consent decree didn't contemplate, of course, was digital streaming services, but it didn't contemplate lots of other things either. It didn't contemplate CDs. It didn't contemplate, you know, uh, you name it, cassette tapes for that matter. Um, so it's not really that the, that the agreement didn't contemplate digital streaming. What it is is that what I, what I think is really going on here is that content owners are reconsidering whether they want to do things collectively or not, right? When ASCAP and BMI came up, the thought was we need these organizations organizations for a couple of reasons. First, because there's just too many deals to be done and um, we couldn't even identify all the partners we'd have to do deals with. This gives us a one-stop shop to come yeah. and get the deals done and it saves transaction costs. We'd have to sit down and negotiate with all these different parties. In the digital world, a couple of things have changed. Um, first of all, it's not that hard to identify who you need because in the digital scheme of things, Players, and there's so many online outlets that make it easy to say, I need deals with X, Y, and Z. Yeah. In addition, because of consolidation in the industry, for better or for worse, um, there's not actually thousands of different deals that need to be done. It depends on the service. You know, you may be a Spotify or Beats where you need, you think you need, you know, 4 million or 20 million songs in your catalog. But there are a lot of smaller services, maybe take Shuffler, for example, who could do a handful of deals with their particular labels and, and be covered. Um, so what this, what this whole mess is really calling into question is the value of these collectives. Yeah. Because if, if ASCAP and BMI want to withdraw their digital rights and leave their other rights, that's really them saying, we want to do our own deals. 
Right. You know, and, and if that's, and, and that's the case, a, then that's the case. They don't have to belong, and that's what the rate court said to them. Okay, fine. Yeah. You want to do your own deals? Take all of your, take your ball and go home. You yeah. can't, you know, take some of your toys and go home and leave the rest of your toys. You've got to gather up all that off the playground yeah. because if you leave them in here, it's unfair to the services like Pandora and so forth who are licensing piecemeal because they're, they're you know, first of all, they have to then turn around and renegotiate with you, and second of all, they're not getting what they thought they'd paid for. Yeah. You know, that's 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 the real. It's, 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 it's quite a mess because on the one side you think you know. Uh, of course, Sony ATV and UMPG want to withdraw their digital rights so they can get better rates by a direct deal, and it essentially would be in BMI's and uh, ASCAP's best interest for them not to do that because then they lose bargaining power when it comes to renegotiating their own rates uh, because if they lost some of their primary rights holders that have the best tracks, essentially, then they're left with everything else. Sure. On the legal side, we call this adverse selection, and all it means right. is that when the big, powerful guys leave, they take their big powerfulness with them. So what's left behind are all the small labels, all the mom and pops who not only have less bargaining power now because they don't have any ATV behind them to sort of navigate this blanket license, um, but they're also less well-funded because yeah. these organizations run off of you know membership fees and a percentage of royalties collected. And when you know 80% of the royalties collected walk out the door, you've got a really poor organization yeah. um, that's toting this blanket license that's worth a lot less. Yeah. And this and is course, problematic for all the guys who, 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 who aren't Sony ATV. <laughs> and of course, you know, we're talking about publishing here, so uh, just so you know that the numbers on digital are still in the, in the single digits when it comes to percentage of revenues uh, for, you know, the, the totality of ASCAP and BMI's uh, incomes. So that's always something to keep in mind because you know they want to withdraw their rights on the digital front, but they certainly don't want to do that on, on all the other fronts because ASCAP and BMI are still doing a fantastic job in uh, collecting royalties and redistributing them to, to the right people. So uh, I, I guess that's where Sony TV and UMPG are in a bit of a pickle now because looking at the future, they want to withdraw the digital rights, but looking at the present and the current hard-earned cash, then it's definitely in their interest to stay within those organizations. So that's very, right. very interesting, very interesting. Uh, guys, I don't know if you have any, any comment on that. I know it's a pretty convoluted issue, but... Uh, <laughs> But, no. Uh, no. Okay. Cool. <laughs> that's the yeah. The, the, it's a deep topic, right? Awesome. It's, yeah. Exactly. I think you've covered it perfectly well, guys. I will <laughs> shut the hell up and there you get on with that one. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, you know, I, I think I'll wrap it up here. I just want to mention uh, to listeners to go and check out the uh, Tani Tempa uh, app. Uh, his uh, wrap up, uh, which is uh, really cool, and uh, it was made by some of our friends uh, at uh, We Make Awesome Shit, uh, and. Uh, uh, yeah, it's it's doing really well. Lots of uh, uh, gifs and videos and viral things being shared uh, with uh, uh, everybody supporting their tiny Tampa mouth. So definitely go and check it out in the in the in the app store. And uh, that's pretty much it. Well, uh, if you want to plug anything at all, uh, I'll start with Australia uh, on your end. If people want to find out more about you, where should they go? Um, you can go to Cristelia dot com. K R I S T E L I A dot com. If you are a songwriter or a recording artist, I would particularly love to hear from you. I'm I'm doing a survey right now to uh, get artists' opinions on the copyright laws and the changes that they'd like to see. So, awesome. if you're interested in participating, uh, we'll make a donation uh, to Little Kids Rock, and your input will be really helpful in shaping uh, the the congressional hearings that are coming up. That's fantastic. And uh, Kareem, on your end. Uh, well, just, uh, please check out musicallo.com, that's musicallyonebird.com, follow us on Twitter, have a look at the blog, our new report comes out today, um, so please check that out, there's a lead on brands and music and digital platforms, um, so yeah, apart from that, thank you very much, it's great to awesome. be on the show. That's awesome, and uh, Darren, for you, it's multivanone.com, anything else? No, I mean, I think there's so many things going on at the moment, there's not enough time to mention it all. But uh, <laughs> I mean, actually, I suppose, that, I mean, the PR hasn't run yet, but obviously Motive Unknown has now got Lucy Blair on board. Uh, yay. Uh, and Lucy's joined, joined to help me dominate the world uh, one campaign at a time. So, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, we haven't kind of PR'd that yet. Uh, it's not a secret either. We just, <laughs> you know, to be honest, I think we're both too busy to stop and figure out the PR bit. But... Um, <laughs> Yeah, Lucy's on board. I'm really pleased. It's taken me over a year to to snag Lucy onto the team. So uh, I'm I'm super super pleased. Um, that's great. And yeah, so uh, so that's 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 the 
the thing I want to mention. Perfect. I think there, all the other things can, can probably wait till next time. Awesome. <laughs> That's great. Well, thanks so much again for taking the time to come on the show. It was fantastic having you on. And uh, thanks so much for listening to DMT. The show comes out every Wednesday. There's also a DMT one-to-one -one show, which comes out every week with uh, individual interviews with startups and interesting digital marketing projects. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week. And until next time.